All right, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Miranda Hitchcock. I'm one of the founders of Every Dog Behavior and Training. We are a local nonprofit here in Austin, and our goal is to try and make training more accessible for everybody in our community. So overcoming any barriers we can to making people be able to get training and behavior support for them and their pups. Um, so we do a whole bunch of different things. We offer consultations. Um, we're hoping to start some classes in the near future. We're going to be doing a reactive dog group for those um, who are interested in joining. And we do these free webinars a couple times a month. We actually have a whole bunch coming up. So if you haven't yet, check out some of the other things we have, including some stuff about veterinary behavior, some stuff about owning a new dog. If you know anyone who is Spanish speaking, we have two Spanish speaking webinars coming up as well as one about separation anxiety. So lots of fun stuff coming up that we are really excited about and we do offer both free and paid services. So if you know anybody who's looking, please let them know that they can check us out. Um, a couple of quick notes about tonight. This is going to be recording. I'll send out the link to everybody tomorrow. You're welcome to share it with whomever you like. Um, and if you have questions as we go through the presentation, please just use the chat box. That way at the end, we can make sure that we get all of the questions to Heather. Um, please do keep yourselves muted so that we don't get any background noises during the presentation. I will mute myself also because my dog will probably start barking. Uh, so please keep yourselves muted. And if you have any other questions as we go, put them in the chat box. I'll try and answer things as we go. And then if you have questions for Heather, we'll take care of those at the end. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Heather to introduce herself and then we will go ahead and get started. All right, um, hi everyone, thanks for coming. And thank you to Miranda and Every Dog Austin for creating this awesome webinar library to benefit our dog loving community. Uh, I'm Heather Clever. I have been a trainer for almost nine years now. I'm a CPDTKA, which stands for Certified Professional uh, Dog Trainer, Knowledge Assessed. And I'm a senior trainer for Train My Dogs Austin. All right, uh, let's dive in. I'm going to pull up the slideshow here. Hmm. Miranda, can you see the slideshow okay? It's telling me sharing is paused. Yeah, it's still, it's showing, but we're just seeing the whole thing like the slideshow hasn't started. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, so introduction to cooperative care. Uh, so first, we need to know what is cooperative care. Uh, cooperative care is a low stress approach to grooming, handling, and vet care. It involves proactively training for care scenarios so they're familiar to the dog and not scary. And it gives the dog the tools to be an active and willing participant in their own care. So instead of this being something we're doing to our dogs, it becomes something we're doing with our dogs and it becomes it can become a really powerful bonding experience that sows trust, as opposed to more traditional kind of hold them down and get it done approaches, which can quickly create suspicion and distrust. If you've ever had a dog that ran away when you pulled out the nail clippers or uttered the word bath, you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, cooperative care training can be applied to almost any aspect of caring for your dog from routine grooming and maintenance at home, like nail trims and baths and uh, ear cleaning uh, to veterinary care, like blood draws and physical exams at the clinic. It's a gigantic topic. So for the purposes of this webinar, we'll be talking primarily about training for the context of vet visits. Cooperative care gives the dog the ability to communicate with us whether they're ready for the care procedure. Uh, one popular way of achieving this type of communication is by using what trainers call a start button. Uh, <laughs> So the start button is a behavior the dog can do to initiate the procedure. For example, we have Levon here to the right performing a chin rest while I trim his nails. Uh, during a training session like this, I'll periodically pause the session and toss a treat away from the training area. 
If the dog readily returns and resumes the chin rest or other chosen start button behavior without being asked, I know that they're feeling pretty confident and they're ready to do more. If the dog- hey, Heather, right now I'm still seeing the intro slide. Are others able to see the slides with Levon? Will you pop something in chat and let us know if you're still seeing that first slide? Okay, yeah, it looks like we're, we're stuck on the first one. Heather, if you wouldn't mind trying to unshare and then reshare. Um, we might be able to get back to the presentation. Okay, let's try this. Because Heather has a whole bunch of really cute videos for us that are helpful. So we want to make sure we can see those. Yeah, absolutely. Can you see? Oh, there we go. Yep. Uh, okay, you're on the yep, Y Cooperative Care side. Oh, perfect. All right. Are we in the right spot perfect. now? <laughs> what is cooperative care? We have a pup on the couch. Okay, awesome. Uh, so perfect. So um, we've got leave on there. Uh, if the dog doesn't return to the training area uh, or they uh, cannot maintain that trained behavior associated with the care we're trying to give, that's valuable information for us. It lets us know that uh, what we're asking for is too hard or too stressful for the dog. And to get the results we want, we need to break the process down into some smaller achievable steps. Of course, uh, sometimes circumstances require that our dog receives care now, and this level of two-way communication is not always possible. Uh, necessary care will always be given, but we have a lot of opportunity between those required vet visits and sudden pressing issues to prepare our dogs. There are also a lot of options for reducing stress that you can discuss with your vet for when the only option is to get it done, and we'll touch more on that later. So why do we need cooperative care? Well, because grooming and veterinary care are inescapable parts of everyday life. It's something we don't often think about until we have a dog that's having a hard time, but a it has a massive impact when every nail trim is a struggle uh, or your dog bit the vet and now uh, not only has a new bite history, but now every vet visit is an ordeal. If you have a puppy, Care is an essential part of their socialization. We can teach our puppies right from the start that the vet is really fun and that being felt all over, having funny equipment in their face is totally normal. When veterinary visits and everyday handling are introduced to an impressionable puppy in a fun and low stress way, uh, you can create an enjoyable learning experience that grows their overall confidence and forms a lasting positive association with vet care. If you have a dog who is already sensitive to being handled or to vet visits, a behavior plan that incorporates cooperative care can help. And I experienced this firsthand with my late Rottweiler, Tony. Tonio had a series of vet visits and surgeries related to tearing his cruciate ligament in his knee. And of course, having a torn ligament and having to go through so much of the vets wasn't very fun for him. And he developed a pronounced sensitivity to being examined by the vet. He would come into the clinic happily and greet the vet and text happily in the exam room, but the moment there was any hint that the exam was about to start, he would get tense and then explode into these roaring barks and lunging. Um, but after training Tony in some cooperative care exercises and incorporating them at our visits, he was able to have exams and even receive injections without becoming defensive or requiring any kind of restraint. In part, Cooperative care helps because it gives the dog a feeling of empowerment and safety. Think about the last time that you went to the dentist. Uh, did you feel nervous or afraid? How would you feel if you were strapped in the dentist chair and you had no idea which procedures your dentist was about to perform and you couldn't communicate with your dentist? That's a lot scarier, isn't it? Um, and I don't know about you, but the knowledge that I can raise my hand to ask for a break at any time while my dentist is working on my teeth helps me to get through the visit. And it's similar with our dogs. Knowing that they can communicate with us and get procedures to pause when they ask goes a long way to helping them feel secure. Cooperative care and management uh, reduces the risk of dog bites. So vets and groomers get bitten uh, more often than most other groups of people. Uh, and that's because of the natures of their jobs. They need to efficiently perform procedures on animals, many of whom are frightened or don't feel well. So the dog feels fearful or painful and they don't understand what's happening. And then ultimately they try to defend themselves. 
In the end, it greatly reduces the stress on the dog, the owners, and the care professional when the dog is able to willingly cooperate on their own care. So before we launch into some really technical stuff, I wanted to let you guys see some cooperative care in action. The first two videos that we'll play show some earlier stages of training, and the next two will show some actual veterinary procedures being performed with a dog's active participation. Just a quick content warning, there is a video depicting a blood draw. I'll warn you guys before playing that video so anybody that doesn't like blood or needles can look away. So this is Bo practicing his chin rest behavior. And I'm rehearsing looking inside his ears like we'll have to do at the yes. vet. And here's Fox getting his first ever nail trim. Yeah. He's not being restrained in any way, just kind of hanging out, happily getting treats in between these nail clips. Yeah. And this is my toenail doing a chin rest during an exam with his awesome vet. Uh, he is not super relaxed in this session, but he feels confident enough to keep participating. So he does his chin rest, the vet touches him a little bit, and then I'm going to tell him that that was great. He's going to get a treat. And then finally, we have Shinobi doing his head up behavior for Houston veterinarian, Dr. Ola, while she draws blood from his neck. Uh, some people wonder why the neck. It's common to do blood draws from the dog's jugular vein as this allows for quick collection. And it does go very quickly in the video. Um, so if you need to look away, now's the time. And then he gets his cookie. Great. So as you can see, there's a lot we can do to effectively care for our dogs while creating a predictable and collaborative environment. Cooperative care isn't just for pets either, by the way. If you guys get bored sometime, Google cooperative care in zoo animals, and you'll see similar work being done with crocodiles, hyenas, big cats, you name it. So in a few minutes, we'll talk about some common cooperative care exercises and how you can get started at home. Uh, but before we go any further, we need to define some training terms. So just really quickly here, a cue is something that tells the dog what to do. A cue can be verbal, like the word sit or stay. Cues can also be physical, like patting the sofa to invite a dog up. Uh, they can be contextual or tactile. Anything that prompts the dog to perform a certain behavior is considered a cue. Markers are used in training to let the dog know the instant they did what the trainer wanted and why they're about to be rewarded. Uh, so like cues, markers can take many forms. There are audible markers. One you may have heard of is the clicker, the little handheld device that makes a distinct clicking sound. A lot of trainers like myself just use a verbal yes or good as their marker. Uh, there are also visual markers, such as the thumbs up gesture that's commonly used with deaf dogs. And tactile markers like a gentle tap on the shoulder are also commonly used with deaf dogs. Uh, as a quick example of when to use the marker, uh, if you were training a dog to sit, 
the marker would be given the moment the dog's butt came in contact with the ground. <laughs> uh, so rewards are given after the dog has performed a behavior. Rewards are commonly food treats just because the majority of dogs love food and food allows for quick repetitions and training. Uh, but rewards can be anything that the dog likes enough to work for. So a thrown tennis ball, being let off the leash to go play, et cetera. Release cue. Uh, release cues are essentially the at ease cues of dog training. Uh, for example, after asking your dog to wait at the door, you might say free or okay to let them know that they can go through the door. Free or okay would be the release cue there. Criteria are the things the dog must do in order to earn the marker and reward. For example, at the sit, our criteria would be that the dog lowers its bottom until said bottom touches the ground. Then a stimulus, we're gonna mention this a lot in this webinar. A stimulus is anything the dog can perceive in their environment. So sight, sound, smells, touch, taste, et cetera. And then plus CER, that's a positive conditioned emotional response. Uh, it's any happy or expectant response to a given stimulus. Uh, so example, we bring the dinner bowl out, our dog gets happy and comes over to us. They have a positive conditioned emotional response to seeing that food bowl. The most important term we'll talk about today is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning uh, is essentially learning through association and it's very important in training. Oxford Languages defines classical conditioning as a learning process that occurs when two stimuli are repeatedly paired. A response that was originally elicited by the second stimulus is eventually elicited by the first stimulus alone. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, well, classical conditioning is also known as Pavlovian conditioning. You may have heard of Av Ivan Pavlov, but if you haven't, Pavlov was studying dogs and their salivation in response to being fed. He hypothesized that dogs would salivate in response to food being placed in front of them, but he accidentally discovered that the dogs would also start salivating as soon as they heard the footsteps of the research assistant who was bringing them the food. This response was completely reflexive on the dog's part. They weren't trained to do it and they weren't even doing it on purpose. Uh, so the salivating was originally caused by the food, but because the footsteps always came before the food, the footsteps began to cause the salivating all on their own. And these types of associations are happening all the time. Dogs and humans and basically all animals learn through this unconscious process of association. It's important to keep that in mind as our dog goes through training and through life. Sometimes things going on in the environment during training can impact how our dog feels about the training, even though we didn't intend for that to be a part of the session. In the wise words of animal trainer, Bob Bailey, Pavlov is always on your shoulder. Classical counter conditioning is when we use classical conditioning to take a stimulus the dog originally found aversive or unpleasant and we consistently pair it with something the dog loves. So we're kind of countering that previous emotion that they had. It goes hand in hand with desensitization. Uh, you'll often see the two notated together in dog training as CCDS. In systematic desensitization, the animals gradually exposed to a stimulus they find unpleasant, such as an object, place, or event. And the intensity of the exposures gradually increase as the animal learns to cope. In our case, uh, we want to pair stimuli associated with veterinary care to outcomes the dog enjoys, uh, such as an extra tasty bit of meat or cheese, or the opportunity to play with a favorite toy. By the way, guys, when I say extra tasty or favorite toy, I really mean extra tasty or most favorite toy ever, especially in counter conditioning when we're trying to counter some previously aversive feelings. The outcome needs to be so awesome that the dog practically forgets that something stressful happened. Um, when pairing uh, two stimuli for classical conditioning, the order is very important. Uh, if Pavlov's dogs had seen the food appear before they heard the research assistant's footsteps, the footsteps would never have become the trigger for salivation. Uh, so when working on cooperative care with our dogs, we must be very careful that the food is offered after the care related stimulus. If the food is offered before the care procedure or at the same time, the care procedure will not predict the good food and we're not going to get that um, emotional 
change that we're looking for. When done right, classical conditioning will produce the almighty plus CER. There's that term again, plus CER. Let's take a closer look at that. So a plus CER means our dog is happy and expectant when presented with a given stimulus. In the video I'm about to play, Tony is engaged in a super fun game of tug, one of his favorite games, and with one of his favorite people, Chris. I had been working on teaching him to be comfortable with the Dremel, which is a handheld rotary tool that some dog owners use to maintain their dog's nails. It's kind of like a high octane nail file. Um, and the Dremel makes a lot of noise. So the first step was for me to get Tony comfortable with the sound before ever trying to touch it to his nails. So to do that, I would have Chris turn the Dremel on in another room so the sound wasn't super loud right next to Tony. And then I would open the refrigerator and spoon out some wet canned dog food for Tony. I personally think that wet canned dog food is pretty gross, but Tony thought it was pretty awesome. Uh, so let's see what happens when I turn the Dremel on when Tony is in the middle of his favorite game. I don't think you guys can hear the audio in this video, but you can see the moment that I turn the Dremel on. And it's just this really loud kind of mechanical whirring sound. So he came away pretty quickly, right? Um, he couldn't really get to me fast enough. He kind of whipped his head away from the toy and came trotting over. And I would say that that is a successful, positive conditioned emotional response. There's really no room for doubt that he was really happy and expectant about what the Dremel sound meant. And so what did it mean? Um, well, he came over to me and he got a Kong filled with wet canned dog food. I had prepared that Kong way in advance, so Tony didn't realize it was there until he heard the Dremel. So once we achieve that plus CER with one step in our training plan, we can move on to the next steps in the process. And training plans are going to be individual to every dog. Um, if your dog is currently worried about some care scenarios, please work with a qualified professional who can guide you through an effective behavior modification plan. Next, I want to talk about some common cooperative care exercises that can be applied in various ways, depending on your dog's needs and how you can start training them at home. We don't have time to cover every exercise out there, but these three behaviors can be used to build many other cooperative behaviors. So we'll be talking about the stand, the hand target, and as we saw with Tony, the chin rest. So for the stand, the stand is really helpful because it can allow you or your vet to easily access the dog's whole body uh, for exam. Sometimes the vet needs to kind of palpate the, the dog's tummy. Uh, sometimes they need to get to their hindquarters. If the dog is sitting, that's a lot harder. Uh, at home, it's easier to access the dog's entire body for things like baths or brushing or checking for ticks, stickers or injuries, etc. I like to practice the stand the way that I will need to use it. Um, so if I need the dog I'm working with to stand in the tub or the shower, we practice first in the living room until they understand what the stand is. Then we move the sessions to the tub or shower, which has the added benefit of making the bath area into a fun place where we sometimes get treats. Thanks, classical conditioning. If I'm working with a small dog, it's likely they'll need to be placed on an exam table at the vets. Uh, so I'll start the stand on the ground, but quickly move it to a table uh, or other stable elevated surface for the training. If your dog isn't comfortable being on the table, you can start by practicing with a bath mat with a non-slip backing on the ground. Then you can place the mat on a low platform and practice on that platform and eventually work up to placing the bath mat and the dog on a higher table. So let's look at how to start the stand with Merle. I'm gonna play the video through uh, and then we'll go back and dissect what's happening with the training.
Okay, so we're going to go back and look at that again. And I'm going to kind of pause as I'm talking to you guys about this. Um, so he starts off sitting. So I use that little lure around. I've got a little food in my hand that I'm using to lure him. Uh, luring him around in that circle just to get him up and standing. Um, I keep my lure hand at his natural nose level. So if it were to go up too high, it might make him want to sit. If it were to go down too low, it might make him want to lie down. If that's something you've worked with the dog on already. Uh, so I need it to be right about his natural nose level and try to keep that head and spine pretty level while I'm working. Once I get him standing, then I can start to feed some tiny rapid fire treats directly to his mouth. And we're going to pause. Notice I'm feeding directly in front of him so he doesn't have to really lean or take a step to reach the treat. So here we go, right in front. And notice that his four feet stay planted in place as I feed. And then we're using that little release to kind of give him a chance to have a break and come back. Oops. So I'm trying to time that release cue for before he moves out of the position himself. That's going to help me build up my duration a little more effectively. So I start to briefly remove my hand from his mouth just super briefly so he doesn't need those treats right there the whole time. And again, we're going to free him, do that release cue. He's going to come back. And I'm starting to pop the treat really quickly behind my back here. So he doesn't need it right in front of him. Oops, I dropped one, so I'm going to free him. And now I'm starting to work on more duration. So it's pretty subtle, but it's starting to spend more time behind my back here. Okay, so once you get to that point, it's pretty easy to gradually start adding more seconds between treats, gradually being the key word. So don't try to go from two seconds like I have here to 10 seconds in one jump. You can start moving to three seconds. Then if your dog was successful, you can try four or five and so on. You wanna go for pretty small increments initially. And once you've built up some duration for the stand, then you can begin adding some handling or grooming exercises, which we'll look at with this video of Chase. Uh, Chase is in the very beginning stages of being handled while maintaining the stand. So I'm gonna work to make things really easy for him. Uh, we're practicing paw handling, which involves my hand reaching out and touching his legs and paws. Uh, at these very beginning stages, you'll see I'm presenting the stimulus of my handling hand, uh, my hand that's going to uh, reach out and touch him before I bring my treat hand out um, or just barely before. So between repetitions, both hands disappear behind my back. And then a split second before my treats appear, my handling hand appears. So they disappear. This closer hand's gonna pop out just barely before that feeding hand. And as Chase gets better at this, I can delay the appearance of the treat hand for longer periods until eventually I'm completing the entire reach handle and letting go of Chase's paw before the treat comes out. So the hand target, which is commonly given the verbal cue touch, teaches the dog to touch their nose to your hand. And aside from being super adorable and a behavior most dogs end up thinking is pretty fun to do, it has endless applications. It can be used to call your dog to you. You can use the touch to get your dog to step onto the scale at the vet. You can reposition your dog during a vet visit without needing to actually physically move them yourself. And you can also throw it into the middle of a care session to help keep your dog motivated. Um, those care sessions and vet visits can be hard work for our dogs. So breaking it up with some fun and easy behaviors that they know really well here and there can help to can you keep up their morale? So I'm gonna show you what the touch looks like after the dog has acquired this skill, and then I'll show you how to get it started. 
This is Fox practicing the hand target with me. I'm not telling him uh, what to do here. So I'm not actually saying touch or anything like that. So what would the cue be here? Um, the cue is my hand being offered out flat and that's a visual cue for a fox to touch it. If your dog already has a behavior like shake that uses a visual cue that looks too much like the flat hand, you can modify your hand to look slightly different. For example, you can stick out uh, one finger or you can offer out like a fully closed fist. So it'll end up looking kind of like your dog's fist bumping you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to play that one more time. Not you. I'm a little technically challenged, you guys. Uh, so notice that when Fox touches my hand in this video, you can see him confidently reach out and push his nose into my hand. Let's see one more nice, confident little nose touch. Yeah. Boom. Nice. So let's look at starting the hand target. Um, so as you can see, he's not really going for it there. Um, when you're starting out, we want to offer the hand really close to the dog, but allow the dog to close that final gap to our hand. We don't want to be the ones kind of reaching out and pushing our hand against our dog's nose. Most dogs will be curious and want to sniff your hand if you offer it at their face height. And you can mark them with that yes. Uh, when they accidentally make contact with your hand. Uh, Fox wasn't so easy, and this is perfect for you guys to see in case uh, your dog doesn't just automatically check out your hand. So he's confused, he doesn't really touch my hand. I don't respond by pushing my hand against his nose. I keep it at the same point in space and I'm trying to entice him by rotating, yeah. wiggling my fingers. Uh, sticking it out at new angles. And finally, when I brought my hand below his uh, nose level, he was able to reach out and try it. Yes. So as he touches, I mark with that yes. And then I toss his treat behind him. This sets him up to walk back toward me. And sometimes that momentum of returning yes. to the handler can make it easier to get them to complete that uh, return to the hand and do some more contact. I'll yes. accept any contact with my hand at this stage, even if it's really light, you know, barely there and accidental. As the dog starts to understand why we're marking them, yes. their contact will become more deliberate and you'll feel a little oomph behind it, kind of like they're pressing a button. Once you feel that really deliberate pushing sensation, you can add a verbal cue to this behavior if you want to. Uh, to add the verbal cue, I would say my verbal cue, whatever word I choose, I like to say touch. I've had people name it nose or boop, which is really cute. Um, but you'll say your verbal cue, like touch, and then you'll offer your hand out. So almost the exact same thing. We're just giving that verbal cue before our hand does anything. Okay. Uh, so aside from being a low stress way to move your dog, that touch can also be used to build on other cooperative care behaviors. You can use the touch to guide your dog into a chin rest, which we're about to check out. Uh, or you can use it to teach your dog to do their head up like Shinobi did for his blood draw uh, or to put their head in the cone of shame. <laughs> this is a few examples. So next is the chin rest. For the chin rest, the dog rests their head on a surface while handling or care is given. You can teach the dog to offer their chin to your hand on a table or virtually any other surface. I believe little Prin here is uh, chin resting on a radio. That's perfectly tiny Prin height. <laughs> it can be trained in a stand position, um, which is popular for reasons we've already discussed, or it can be trained in a sit or a down just depending on what you and your dog need. I like the chin rest as a start button behavior. It's one option out of many for creating a consent test. So as mentioned earlier uh, with a start button, the dog is released from the position. And if the dog resumes the behavior, that lets us know that they're ready to do more. Okay. So we're gonna see how we started. So to start the chin rest, I offered out a hand in a cupped position just below the dog's chin. Then I use a treat lure in my other hand to guide the dog's head downward. As the dog's head bobs down and makes contact with my cupped hand, I mark yes and feed the treat. 
So I don't think you guys can hear the audio in these videos. So I'll be just marking myself as we watch. I freed him. So after some repetition, then you can start offering your cupped hand all by itself without doing that little lure and see if your dog will offer the head bob on their own. If that happens, then you can just go ahead and mark and feed. Uh, if your dog doesn't offer the head bob, you can go back to practicing the luring motion a few more times, then try to allow the dog to offer the bob on their own again. So let's see how Louie here does when I just start to offer my hand by itself. Yeah. And he started to kind of get that and offer his chin pressing into my hand. So once we get that, we can start to add a verbal cue. We can add more duration onto it. Okay. So just like the stand, it's that slow increase for your duration criteria. And then you can begin incorporating like some easy touching and handling. You can often start with some petting along the dog's neck or back or wherever they seem most comfortable, then progress to petting other parts of the body. This video with Leanne Hurley, a local Austin trainer, is a lovely example. First, she warms up the dog with some chin rests all by themselves, some easy touching reward, easy touching reward. We'll see here in a second. Just that start along the back. And she moves down his leg to his foot. And just a quick note here, this is not the first time this dog has done this. That foot lift likely had to be built up slowly in previous sessions. And in this session, Leanne also warmed him up before trying to handle to that extent. So check out how she frees him. And then he comes right back so that's the start button. He's saying, okay, I'm ready. Let's go again. If you like wandered away or seemed reluctant to come back, uh, that's really important information for us about his current co comfort level with the handling that we're doing. And if he were to stop doing the chin rest mid handling, that's also important information. So I'm going to pause really quick because I want you to see uh, that motion that she just did. So Lan is starting to touch and manipulate the skin between the dog's shoulder blades. This is a common area for injections to be given. So often the vet will pull the skin up, also known as tenting. And we'll see if she, I think she'll do that again for us here. Getting some more paw handling. Oh, I'm gonna play this really quickly again here so you guys can see that skin tenting. Awesome feet handling. This is really good for nails, guys. And then there we go. She's going to pull that up and see how she sticks her pinky in there. Uh, so that's the beginning of simulating a needle. So the dog is getting used to having the skin tented and feeling that dull poke against the tent. As you progress with desensitizing the dog to this sensation, uh, you can gradually use some pointier objects like a capped pen, then an uncapped pen, then a toothpick and so on. Of course, we're not, you know, trying to pierce the dog's skin. We're only getting them used to a slightly pokey feeling. And with a skilled veterinary professional, an actual needle will likely create less sensation than these simulation objects. Uh, it can also be a good idea to practice this move on the dog's forelimbs and hindquarters, which can also be used as injection and blood draw sites. Or you can work on a head up behavior and practice at the jugular like uh, Dr. Olo did with Shinobi. Okay, muzzles. 
you can't talk about behavior modification without talking about muzzles. And muzzles get a, an unfair bad rap, in my opinion. A muzzle doesn't mean that a dog is aggressive or that they're mistreated. You don't have to feel sorry for a dog wearing a muzzle. Um, they might need a muzzle for any number of reasons, such as being scared at the vet, uh, trying to eat dangerous stuff on walks, or maybe you're trying to introduce a friendly dog to somebody who's scared of dogs and feels better when teeth are taken out of the equation. Um, I like to proactively teach every dog to wear a muzzle, ideally from puppyhood, uh, just in case it's needed someday. Uh, so for care specifically, the muzzle adds an extra layer of safety for everyone. A bite is not only bad news for the person being bitten, but also for us and our dogs. So if our dog bites, it has to be reported. The owner could be held financially liable depending on who's bitten. And depending on the laws in your area, a dog that has bitten a certain number of times may be deemed dangerous or have to be humanely euthanized. So we can protect them in any possibly risky uh, scenario by teaching them to happily wear the muzzle. It's really common for vets to ask for dogs to be muzzled before exams, even if the dog has never bitten before. So if we spend time conditioning the dog to the muzzle and have the dog wear the muzzle occasionally at home, on, on walks, and in other contexts, the muzzle never becomes a predictor that something scary is about to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to the vet or we're going to be handled. And if you are going to the vet, then the muzzle doesn't add even more stress due to the dog not use, being used to wearing it. You know, then they've got all these different things going on. We're at the scary vet. We've got this new weird thing that they're putting on my face. So we're making the muzzle something that they're already very familiar with. It becomes a normal part of life, like a leash or a harness. Especially if your dog has already displayed fearful or aggressive behavior surrounding care procedures, the muzzle allows us to work on a behavior modification plan and protect ourselves and our dogs from liability. But the muzzle should never be used to put the dog into a situation we wouldn't put them in if they were not wearing the muzzle. So we're not going to just slap the muzzle on and force the dog through a procedure that they aren't ready for. That's a really fast way to teach the dog to avoid or fight the muzzle. The muzzle is just an extra layer of safety for when we start getting more hands-on and involving the vet in our training. Basket muzzles, like the one Olive is putting her face into here, are the best. They allow the dog to pant, drink, and take treats. There are some cloth muzzles that wrap fully around the muzzle and they work by keeping uh, the dog's mouth fully closed. And that can prevent panting, which can be dangerous. And if those cloth muzzles are fitted tightly enough to prevent biting, it will also make it very difficult to feed treats. And we can make the muzzle a pleasant experience right from the start. So if you place the muzzle in your dog's bowl or you cup it in your hand, like I'm doing here with Olive, you can spread some easy cheese or peanut butter or yogurt, whatever your dog likes and is spreadable and a little sticky on the inside and let your dog just lick it out. They'll think it's the best thing ever. You can also line the muzzle with parchment paper and fill it with your dog's kibble or some other treats and let your dog just eat out of it. It basically starts off as an alternative Kong. If you guys know that food dispensing toy, the hollow rubber kind of snowman shape. Um, I'll include some resources at the end of the presentation where you can learn more about how to introduce the muzzle. If your dog displays aggressive or defensive behavior during grooming, handling, or veterinary procedures, uh, please work with a qualified trainer to create a behavior modification plan and a management plan for safety. If you're working toward more comfort at the vet clinic, coordinating care with your vet will be essential. If you're working with a trainer, you can ask them to communicate with your vet so that everyone is on the same page. You or your trainer might be able to email a training plan and videos of what you're trying to accomplish during training sessions at the clinic so that your vet is well informed. Ask your vet to set up some happy visits with you. So happy visits are basically quick social calls where your dog comes to the clinic to explore, eat some treats, play with a toy, or get some affection from the staff or maybe all the above, depending on your dog's preferences. 
And there are lots of vet clinics here in Austin that encourage happy visits and will not charge you anything for them. Uh, you just call to check what the best days or times would be to drop by. Uh, and once you work up to practicing cooperative care exercises and handling with the vet, kind of like we saw with Tony in one of those earlier slides, you will then be requiring more of their time. And at that point, it might make sense to reserve a paid appointment. But in the beginning, those happy visits should be just quick and easy free appointments. And of course, right now during the pandemic, the vast majority of clinics are not allowing owners inside. You might be able to arrange with your vet to meet you outside in the parking lot for the happy visit, or they might offer to bring your dog in for some fun social time while you stay in the car. Whether these options are feasible for your dog depends entirely on your dog's needs and comfort levels. Um, some dogs are already afraid as soon as they get to the clinic parking lot. So eating some treats in the car or hanging out with the staff in the parking lot might uh, be where they need to start anyway. If you're looking for a vet, the Fear Free website is a great resource. Okay. Um, more and more vets are undergoing the Fear Free certification to learn more about dog body language, low stress handling, cooperative care, and other options for helping their patients feel more at ease. And we have quite a few Fear Free vets and clinics in Austin. There are a lot of great vets that are not Fear Free certified. The vet that helped me with my Tony was not a Fear Free vet, but if you don't already have a vet, the Fear Free website can be a good place to start. Ideal happy visits start out with very low criteria and very high value outcomes. So we want our dogs to just exist in the clinic, the parking lot or the exam room and get to eat the best food ever and play with their very favorite toys. If your dog loves affection and petting when it doesn't involve an actual exam, they can also hang out and enjoy some social attention from the staff. And whether you have a new puppy who's just learning about the vet or a dog that has already developed some fears, the happy visits should be the majority of visits to the vet. With a new puppy, I like to take them for a happy visit that incorporates some light handling and all that other good stuff that we mentioned about once a week. For a dog that has already developed some sensitivities uh, during the initial happy visits, we're just going there to have some fun and nothing remotely related to exams or medical equipment happens. Uh, once we've done a few of those and we can tell uh, our dog can just exist confidently in the space, then we can incorporate some super, super easy practice into the subsequent happy visits. We're building that plus CER, just like with every other step of the training plan. When your dog is feeling pretty good about the location and the staff, some of your visits can involve more serious cooperative care training at your dog's pace. These visits are still all about having a good time and just practicing without any actual pressure to fulfill a real medical need. Uh, so even though we're starting to work on some more challenging stuff, we can still back off and give the dog a break or end the session at any time. Make a plan with your vet, guys. Uh, make a plan with your vet for how to manage your dog when your dog needs care that cannot be delayed or worked around the training plan. Your vet might recommend an option like PVPs or pre-visit pharmaceuticals to address the neurotransmitters that are related to fear and stress to make the vet the visit easier for your pet. These aren't to sedate your dog. They're not to, you know, drug them up or knock them out. It's to alleviate some of that intense anxiety so they don't get completely set back in their training plan. The bottom line here is to just communicate with your vet and plan ahead. All right, that's about all I have for you guys tonight. I'll be addressing your questions soon. Um, but if you wanna talk more or you need help with training, you can contact me through my email address or the contact form on our website. And I've also got some helpful resources listed over here. The Fear Free website, fearfreepets.com. Uh, for all things Muzzle, the Muzzle Up Project is great, muzzleupproject.com. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this tonight. It's a huge topic in and of itself, but Kristen Cristejo's uh, YouTube channel has a video series on understanding dog body language. That is an excellent resource for learning to read your dog. Uh, and understanding dog body language is going to be important to training success in basically any training plan, especially when we're talking about behavior modification. 
Awesome. Thank you, Heather. That was great. As you guys can see, it's a, it's a big topic. Um, it's something that I wish had been around uh, years and years ago, but it's growing uh, a lot in popularity, which is really cool and very exciting. Um, so we have a bunch of really good questions in here. So if you have other questions, pop them in there. Uh, the first one, do you randomly take breaks or do you watch for signs of overstimulation or boredom from the dog before you take breaks? So that's a great question. So you definitely do always want to be on the lookout for any signs of that overstimulation or boredom, but ideally we want to take breaks before we see those. So I'm usually aiming to do a few reps here and there and then kind of give the dog a free moment before I think that they actually need it. So about paw, sens paw desensitization, for dogs who are extra sensitive, would you start higher on the shoulder and work down? Absolutely. So perfect. And you can kind of uh, apply that concept to any part of your dog's anatomy. So if they have a particular area that you're trying to work toward and you know is more sensitive for them, you can always start with an area that they're really confident about that you know they love during regular petting. And um, a lot of dogs love like their chest or kind of the shoulders and their back. Obviously, it's going to vary uh, according to dog, but you can always start at a place that they find easier and then slowly kind of work your way down. And we saw a little bit of that in Land's video with the dog who was doing his chin rest on the chair. She kind of started up on his back and then did a little bit of kind of shoulder, upper arm, and then started to work her way down to the paw. So yes, absolutely. Awesome. So someone asked, what do you do if the dog breaks the chin rest and wanders away? Yeah, so we're still going to tell them, great job, you've communicated with us. I will even kind of toss a treat after them because we want them to know that that is an option uh, that they can communicate with us. Um, and I did this with Tony, uh, with my vet when we were working with him. In the beginning, he was super nervous and kind of even the vet kind of stepping close would make him kind of tense up and give a really kind of hard stare. And so uh, if he did that and he broke his chin rest to kind of stare at her, we would say, okay, and kind of I'd free him, give him a little treat. She would step a little further away. Um, and then I would kind of go back a step and just work with him doing like the touch, little easy things, doing the chin rest with the vet on the other side of the room. And then we can kind of work our way back. So it's just really good communication. It lets you know okay, that was too much and we might need to go back a step and then kind of slowly work our way up to whatever it was that made our dog break the cooperative care behavior. Yeah. Awesome. So what if your dog is so stressed out, he won't take any treats? So that, yeah, so that's um, a situation that you would need to talk about most likely with your trainer and with your vet. And that might be, again, another situation where those PVPs that we mentioned, uh, the pre-visit pharmaceutical might make it easier for your dog. And then you might have to figure out where you need to start. So if your dog is way too stressed in the exam room, maybe we need to start out in the waiting room. Maybe we need to start out in the parking lot, or maybe we need to start in the car in the parking lot, that sort of stuff, okay? So a related question. My dog took treats in the car in the parking lot of the new vet, super food motivated, but even after three attempts, remained hypervigilant and super anxious. How could I step back from that? She's not anxious in the car in general. Okay, so um, that is a good question. And it sounds like she just needs more time and more repetition. So a lot of times these uh, behavior plans are going to be a little bit slow moving because we're dealing with emotions and likely an emotion that the dog has had reinforced time and time again. And, you know, if you're working on even with people kind of going to therapy, usually it's not like I'm going to go see my therapist three times and then yeah, I'm not depressed anymore. <laughs> you know, it's going to take a while and be really incremental. And so you might have to do that visit, you know, dozens of times to just the parking lot. And you might want to experiment with seeing if your dog can play a little bit somewhere, maybe in the car. Play can also be really great at kind of loosening our dogs up, giving them some nice endorphins and helping them feel safe in a situation. One other thing to think about is we often 
go places in the car and our dogs are fine with that, but staying in the car in a place is kind of weird. And so yeah. that could also be something to think about whether if you went to Target and sat in the car with your dog, would your dog also be really concerned or hypervigilant or anxious there? Cause it might just be being in the car while stopped and not being sure what's going on and being anxious about that. Absolutely. So sometimes there are some other stimulus, you know, something else that's going on that we're not always aware of. Great point, um, Brenda. Any quick tips for bath time? I know it's not a quick process, but just curious if you have any favorite best practices. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I love working on bath time. Um, first of all, just making the area where the bath happens really fun and not always predictive of the actual bath happening. So we'll go and I'll just kind of toss treats around the tub. Um, if you have a slippery kind of tub or shower, it's important to make sure you've got some kind of non-slip liner in there um, because if your dog doesn't feel stable and they're worried about slipping and you know wiping out, that is pretty painful, not very fun. So make sure that they've got a nice non-slip surface there to work with. I'll sometimes just feed meals in there. If my dog eats kibble, I'm literally just kind of scattering it around for my dog to find. We might do some fun training in there, like the touch, anything that my dog loves to do. Um, some chewies, we might even play in there if my dog is able to like do a little tug, anything like that. So building up that the, the tub is fun. And then practicing our cooperative care exercises in the tub or the general bath time area uh, where my dog isn't actually going to get a bath. We're just practicing, we're gonna do the chin rest and then we're done and then we leave the bath area. <laughs> um, and then we work up to, we're practicing the chin rest uh, with the faucet on, but not the, the bathtub faucet. So they get used to that sensation or that sound of the water running. And then we might start to incorporate the actual like bath faucet and so on. And you, you'll need to kind of see uh, which part is the difficult part for your dog. Yeah, we often joke that it's like we have to play coy a little bit. You want to leave the dog wanting more. So we always want to stop things before they get to the point where they go, okay, this was a little too far. As mm -hmm. much as possible, we want to stop when they're still like, yay, this is awesome. This is great. And be like, oh, I'm sorry. We just don't have time for more right now. So that the next time we come in, they still have that really good positive CER. Yeah. Um, and uh, so. one, one thing to keep in mind with puppies is that a lot of the time, um, so puppies can't regulate their body temperature very well. And so we want to make sure that our water is nice and warm. We want to make sure that the bath area is nice and warm and that we're able to kind of, as soon as we stop the water, we're able to get them wrapped up in a nice warm towel and dry them off uh, quickly so that they're not associating that bath with just shivering and feeling miserable. Great point. Um, so we've been working with our dog on muzzle training for a year and we're still just at the putting his nose into the muzzle to eat yummy treat stage, moving to putting the straps around or clipping it in and he goes stiff. So that's too far. I know it's important to move at his speed and comfort, but are there any ideas on how to break it down even further? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we think about that, um, kind of moving the strap around the dog's head, that is a lot different from I was just kind of holding the muzzle there. Uh, so you can think about all of the little steps in between. If we think of it as kind of a movie that we're, we're pausing at each frame, uh, we wanna work on each kind of frame of the movie, if that makes sense. So if my dog can't handle me touching the strap, I might start off, you know, I've got my muzzle in my hand, my dog's nose is in the muzzle. I, I might start off with just kind of opening my other hand and then mark, throw a treat away or feed it into my dog's muzzle. If I'm using it as a start button behavior, I'll definitely be throwing their treat away so that they can choose to come back. Um, but you start out with a little reach, yes treat. Um, if they're doing great with that, a little further reach, I might start off just barely touching the strap and leaving it and dangling down below the dog's chin. Uh, so just moving in really short increments like that. Uh, you can also check that the food that you're using is like super valuable to your dog. Um, another thing about the high value food guys is make sure you are switching it up occasionally. Uh, 
So my favorite food is pumpkin pie, but if I ate pumpkin pie every day, it probably wouldn't take long for me to be begging for no more pumpkin pie. So make sure you've got a nice handful, a little treat arsenal that you can kind of rotate out to keep it exciting for your dog. Um, you can also, there's uh, some games you can play where you're kind of moving backward in the muzzle, where you're kind of holding the treat into the muzzle, or you've got that little spray cheese on the inside. And as your dog tries to move their nose into the muzzle, you're shuffling backward away from them. So they've got to work to kind of move their nose in. Uh, and that can make it a little more fun for them if your dog is a dog that likes to move around. Yeah, there are another couple of things that I've found with some dogs recently with muzzles who didn't like having it strapped in. So there's this like, oftentimes they have their face in there and then there's this big shift that's like, okay, they're about to keep this on my face. But sometimes it's the sound or it's the feeling of the straps. And so yeah. sometimes, honestly, we're just training them that we're just doing this over and over and it's not attached to them. It's right in front of them, but we're getting them used to that. My dog just heard that and got really excited. Um, sometimes it's just kind of like waving the straps around. Hi, Nina. Nina really <laughs> likes her muzzle. That's Nina a positive CER right there. She's like, please let me put my face in there. Um, but so sometimes it's moving stuff around without having it be mimicking what we're actually going to do because the sound of it or the feel of it, or it could even just be having the muzzle on and then touching the neck, but not moving the straps anywhere, but getting used to feeling something on the neck. So just because you think that something's going in a certain order, like it goes on the nose, then we strap it, doesn't mean you have to teach those things in that order. You can teach those pieces separately and then kind of put them together. Um, so that can be helpful. The other thing is if you have a dog who's terrified of their muzzle, um, I can't recommend this strongly enough. Sometimes getting a different kind of muzzle or a different color, taking a red solo cup and cutting out the bottom, using something else that's somewhat muzzle shaped and teaching your dog to put their face in there first. If they're really afraid of the muzzle, then trying to counter that and start from that place where they're not happy about it is way harder than starting with something new. Um, so sometimes it can be easier to just kind of find a creative solution um, that lets you kind of start fresh. There are also a million types of muzzles, um, especially for vet visits uh, and for anything we do, we want them to have enough room to pant in the bottom. We have a tendency to fit these really tight muzzles that kind of hold their mouths closed and a lot of dogs react poorly to that. So sometimes just getting a larger muzzle where they have a little bit more room to breathe in it um, is, can be much easier. And that's why we were talking about the, the basket muzzle versus using something like the cloth muzzle where it really does hold their mouth closed. So uh, lots of tips on that muzzle up project and then they do have a Facebook group as well. Um, and muzzles are awesome. I just one ordered one for my girl that's uh, that's going to be fitted for her. So there's tons of different shapes and sizes depending on on what your dog needs. So um, any other questions? Someone else said, yep, just practicing the clicking sound. Some dogs don't like it. If your dog has a collar that clicks, that's another good thing to try and yeah. see if maybe it's maybe it's that because um, you never know what it could be. Um, any other thoughts, Heather, that you want to share? Uh, no, I think that was great, kind of breaking it up. Um, just like with the tub, we don't need the water to necessarily be coming from the tub at first. We're just getting them used to water noises. Uh, I thought that was all really excellent. And yeah, guys, the Muzzle Up Project, if you have any questions about muzzles, is an excellent resource. So definitely check it out. Yep, absolutely. There are some cooperative care uh, Facebook pages out there if you're interested in that. Um, if you want to learn some cool, like advanced cooperative care strategies, Dr. Laura Haug, H-A-U-G, she's a veterinary behaviorist in Houston, and she has some really cool videos of things like training a very large dog to lay on its side and let people vaccinate it, like a dog who did not like the vet and wanted to eat the vet. Mm -hmm. So lots of incremental progress and things like that jugular blood draw and other you know, cool positioning for dogs who needed something really specific. So depending on what your dog needs, that can be really helpful. And just like visiting the vet, you can also do some of this stuff if you have a good groomer, um, if your dog needs grooming. So that can be, that can be super helpful. Um, yes, as, as Scratch said, uh, many reminders that we all probably go way too fast, even when we think we're going slow. 
So uh, thank you all so much for coming out here. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much to Heather for doing this from Train My Dog Austin. Um, her information was up there. I'll make sure it goes out on the recording as well. So if you have any questions for her, you're welcome to do that. Um, and we'll have our information out there as well. Again, we have a bunch of upcoming webinars, separation anxiety, using management to solve complex problems, a really cool one from Dr. Amy Pike, a vet behaviorist in the DC area. Um, so check out our website and sign up for more webinars. If you want to reach out to us, you can do that anytime. And again, we are a nonprofit, so you can make a donation. If you want a really cool t-shirt that says dog training is for everyone, we have those that we finally got on our site. So if you would like a really cool t-shirt, we have those there as well. So thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. Thanks again to Heather for doing this for us. And Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Okay, bye.